sort of technical difficulties at all in any way, I, I think of this uh, little comedy bit that I saw recently, and it was, it was this guy, he was talking about how, you know, when, it, when a pastor will get up to speak, and there'll be a little crinkle on the microphone, and they'll be like, oh, see, the devil's working already, right? And, uh, and the guy was saying, really? Like, <laughs> you're talking about like a relatively like eternal being, been around since at least the beginning of our time, and you've figured out his grandmaster plan, and it's static in a microphone, right? <laughs> so I always, I always think of that whenever there's a little bit of technical difficulty, and I just, I just laugh. But uh, we're going to figure out the videos. Uh, but seriously, guys, could we give like a quick round of applause to all of our worship people and media people? They, they really, really do a lot for us. Um, some of it's behind the scenes and, and, and some of it's not. But uh, if, you, if you see them, thank, you, thank them for the work that, that they put in. Um, but anyways, w- welcome, guys. Welcome to our first Catalyst. Um, again, my name's Nathaniel, uh, and, and I'm, I'm really pumped and excited to be able to introduce to you guys um, our sermon series for the semester. Um, some of you guys have heard already, or maybe you've looked on the website, but uh, the, the series is called One Hit Wonders. Um, if we have the graphic, maybe we can put it up. If not, that's okay. Uh, our tagline is, why say lot word when few word do trick? Office fans will recognize that. There we go. Kevin from the office. Um, but that's the whole thing of it, one hit wonders. Uh, we're, we're going through the, the smallest books of the Bible. And uh, these books in the Bible, though they're small and um, sometimes overlooked, uh, they, they, they don't have a lot of word, but they do trick, as Kevin would say. And... Uh, I've organized them in kind of roughly chronological order, and so the, the first half of our Catalyst uh, semester is going to be spent mainly on some of the smaller minor prophets, and then the second half we're going to be jumping into some of the really smaller uh, epistles in, in the New Testament. Um, but uh, before we get started here, I just want to thank you guys for coming, um, and, and, and want to uh, encourage all of you uh, to, to start strong and, and, and work, work hard all the way through the semester. Um, I hope for all of you freshmen that your O week was awesome and that you're settling in well. Um, and for those of you that came back from horrible um, internships, that this is a relief to come back to school. Um, some of you, that's the case. <laughs> but uh, our first book for uh, tonight is, is one that uh, I'd be willing to wager a lot of you, maybe some of you don't, don't know much about. And I'll admit, the book of Obadiah. I didn't know much about it before we, we jumped into this sermon series and started kind of doing some prep for it. Um, if you guys have your Bibles, if you want to go ahead and flip to Obadiah, you can. Um, another thing that we do here at CCF, it, it's kind of cool if you're, if you're like a phone Bible guy, um, on the version, no, on the Bible app, um, is it version or Bible app? I don't really use it. I always just use this. Sorry, so the version Bible app, if you go on there and you click events, um, it'll pop up with a map, and it should like sink you down if you're like hooked up to GPS or whatever. And uh, and you'll see Catalyst, and you can click on that. And we try to always upload our uh, our sermon structure and our points and any other like passages that we reference. So feel free to to jump on that if you would like. Um, but the Book of Obadiah. Uh, what I want to do tonight is I want to briefly talk about the the, the context and the, the historical background of the book. So we kind of have our, our heads around what's going on, and then I want to jump into some kind of kind of deeper um, biblical truths that we find in the book. Um, and since we are going to be covering the, since we are going to be covering some really small books, but still sometimes there's some pretty large chunks of scripture, um, that's kind of what we're going to be doing for the semester. We're going to be um, trying, to, trying to hit the overall theme, the overall message of each book. Um, and sometimes that'll be really actually covering the entire book. And sometimes that'll mean that we're focusing in a little bit more on like a main passage or two that, that conveys the overall message of the book. And so that's kind of what we're going to do tonight. Um, we're going to jump in and, and, and talk about some of the, the, the cultural issues and the historical, um, historical stuff and, and who wrote it and why and, and all that stuff. Um, now when we jump into uh, prophetic books, um, this is just kind of something you guys can always remember, um, most prophetic books have a superscription. Um, at the beginning. And so basically what that is, is, is it's just something that usually gives us some sort of reference to what the book is about. Um, sometimes it's why the message was given. Um, usually it's the, the author of the, of the message, the prophet. Um, sometimes it contains dates and things like that. Um, and so when we jump into Obadiah, in the first verse, in the superscription, it says, the vision of Obadiah, period. So we get a lot from that one. Um, <laughs> not as much as most. Uh, but uh, a lot of people, so what you usually do with, with something like this when you don't exactly know who Obadiah is in Scripture, 
not really referenced in other places. Usually what you have to do, and when I say you, I mean people smarter than me, uh, they, they dig around and they, they, they figure out what's going on in the book, they find uh, references to what's being said, and then they look at other historical references and they try to get a pretty good date to what's going on. Um, and I'll kind of save you guys the, the, maybe the boring debates and whatnot, but um, the author is a guy named Obadiah, um, big surprise. And then uh, the, the date, most, most uh, scholars put the date at um, right around the 6th century. Um, and, and the reason they do that is because, uh, is because of what, what we find in the book is that this book is written as a, uh, as a prophetic warning or a prophetic uh, proclamation of justice against a group of people called the Edomites. And what happened with the Edomites was uh, during the Babylonian captivity in the 6th century, um, when, they, when Babylon came in and, and, and took over Israel and took them off as, as slaves and captives, um, the Edomites um, took advantage of the Israelites. Um, the Edomites lived in kind of a mountainous region and, uh, and on the southern kind of tip of Israel. And, uh, and basically what, what they did, as far as we know, historically speaking, was that they kind of stood back and hid in the mountains while the Babylonians marched through. And then when the Babylonians were leaving, the Edomites came down when Israel was at their most vulnerable and, uh, and kind of looted and ransacked and captured people and sold them off to the Babylonians and really just like did the worst thing you could do to an already pretty much pulverized group of people. And, uh, and, and so this is kind of the, the, the background, the setting for um, why God is giving this, this proclamation of justice about the Edomites. Um, now a little bit about the Edomites. Um, actually, this will be a nice little, nice little question. Does anybody know where the Edomites come from? Edom. Esau. John Nation's right. Uh, so Edomites and uh, the Israelites were... Uh, uh, kind of family related in a sense. Um, they both came from the same, uh, the same father, Abraham. Abraham had Jacob and Esau. They were later renamed uh, Israel and Edom. And as you guys know, uh, for some of you that know the story of Jacob and Esau, uh, they were brothers that did not always get along. How many of you guys have brothers in the room? Okay. Those, a, a lot of you know that uh, when you have a brother, he can be both your greatest adversary and also your greatest like ally, right? Sometimes it's like you're, you're getting into trouble together and you're on the same team and like nobody can mess with my brother, right? And then sometimes you're like, how do I kill this dude, right? <laughs> um, well, that was pretty much Jacob and Esau. I mean, if you read their story, it was back and forth and back and forth. And uh, it, it, it does have a pretty good ending because there was some redemption there between the two brothers. Um, but unfortunately, this kind of back and forth relationship with Jacob and Esau carried on into the, their, their lineage, um, the Edomites and the Israelites. And there was kind of bad blood with them for a really, really long time, next couple hundred years. Um, kind of like the, the Hatfield and McCoys. The, it, was, it, was a, kind of a, it would have been kind of a famous, famous family feud, but on a pretty large scale. Um, now, uh, God, uh, God tried to get the Israelites to kind of drop the family feud when they entered the promised land by um, giving them a direct command, actually. It's found in Deuteronomy 23, 7. It says, you shall not abhor an Edomite, for he is your brother. Um, so God kind of tried to, tried to get them off on the right foot when the Israelites came into the promised land. Um, and this was certainly not always followed by the Israelites, especially through some of the times of, of some of the bad kings, especially. Um, and it was definitely not reciprocated by the Edomites when they brutally took advantage of the Israelites during the time of the Babylonian invasion, which is what we're about to read about. And so this is kind of the, the context, this is kind of where um, you know, th this, this book fits in history. Um, and as far as the content of the book, uh, Obadiah is, is really just a, a proclamation of, ju of judgment and justice against the Israelites for taking advantage of them in those ways. And we'll get a little bit more into that. Um, but then when we kind of take a, a step back from the context, um, what we see kind of theologically is, is that this... It, the most plain thing that we see theologically in this book is the righteousness of God. Um, and another way to say that would be to, see, would be to say that we see God's justice, or we see the character of God, and, and we see his justice come out in this book. Now, uh, one commentator, as I was studying, and it's actually kind of in, in the beginning, which is always nice to, nice to have, um, one commentator said that uh, the book of Obadiah is as complicated as it is small, um, and that was, that was really encouraging to like the first commentary I was opening up. It's like, it's as complicated as it is small. I'm like, all right, cool. So uh, bear with me as we jump in here. Um, on the U version, you'll see that the book is kind of roughly broken up into, into three sections. Uh, God's proclamation of what he will do to Edom, 
the reason for his divine justice, and then uh, the hope of final redemption for God's people. And the section that we'll be um, going over today is verses 1 through 16. Let's, let's read verses 1 through 4, and then we'll, we'll, we'll start. So, verse 1, the vision of Obadiah. Thus says the Lord God concerning Edom, We have heard a report from the Lord, and a messenger has been sent among the nations. Rise up, let us rise against her for battle. Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You shall be utterly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you, you who live in the clefts of the rock, in your lofty dwelling, who say in your heart, Who will bring me down to the ground? Though you soar aloft like the eagle, though your nest is set among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. Actually, you know what? I'm going to read through 16. If thieves came to you, if plunderers came by night, how have you been destroyed? Would they not steal only enough for themselves? If grape gatherers came to you, would they not leave gleanings? How Esau has been pillaged, his treasures sought out. All your allies have driven you to your border. Those at peace with you have deceived you. They have prevailed against you. Those who eat your bread have set a trap beneath you. You have no understanding. Will I not on that day, declares the Lord, destroy the wise men out of Edom and understanding out of Mount Esau? And your mighty men shall be dismayed, O Timon, so that every man from Mount Esau will be cut off by slaughter. So that first section is God uh, prophetically speaking, and, and it's God talking about something almost in the present tense, but he's talking about something that will happen. So these are the, 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 the things that God is going to do to Edom. And then verses 10 through 14, we'll read those quickly, are basically the reasons why. It says, Because of your violence done to your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off forever. On the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth, and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. But do not gloat over the day of your brother and the day of his misfortune. Do not rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their ruin. Do not boast in the day of distress. Do not enter the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Do not gloat over his disaster in the day of his calamity. Do not loot his wealth in the day of his calamity. Do not stand at the crossroads to cut off his fugitives. Do not hand over his survivors in the day of distress. All right, so we've got a big section here that all really centers around justice. Um, There's the reasons for God's justice, and then there's what God is actually going to do about it. And it's just kind of in opposite order. Um, The first part is what God's going to do, and then the reason for it. So let's kind of break down uh, some of the verses, 1 through um, 9, and uh, and then we'll kind of get to our first point. And I actually only have one point, so pretty cool. Doesn't mean it's going to be a shorter sermon, but it's just one point. (laughs) So verses 1 and 2, it says, Thus says the Lord God concerning Edom, We've heard a report from the Lord, and a messenger has been sent among the nations. Rise up, let us rise against her for battle. Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You shall be utterly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you, you who live in the clefts of the rock in your lofty dwelling, who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Though you soar aloft like eagles, though your nest is set among the stars, from there I will bring you down. So God said that he would bring down Edom's pride. Um, Edom was a nation, like I mentioned, that, that lived in the mountains. Um, they, were, they were a prideful people, apparently, uh, that, that, that thought of themselves as better, thought of themselves as, 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 as higher up and better than other people. Um, and they considered themselves fairly impenetrable because of this, because of the, the mountainous, rocky, um, really tough terrain that those mountains are. Um, it's, and, and rightfully so, too. It's kind of like, uh, any of you guys watch like old Western movies, like some John Waynes or other old movies? Um, you know that, that like, anytime the good guys are pursuing the bad guys, you know, they're, they're riding on the horses, they're, oh man, I thought of the song. Um, <laughs> You guys know. <laughs> They're riding on their horses, right? They're pursuing the bad guys. <laughs> no, nah, I can't concentrate. They're pursuing the bad guys, and, 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 and they pursue them into like a, like a, a big, like, kind of a, a cavernous uh, uh, like spot between the mountains, right? And the walls are kind of closing in around them, and the bad guys, you know, they're ahead of them, right? And, and they probably got the gold or whatever, and, and the good guys are coming through, and all of a sudden, you know, ambush, right? And you can tell by the music and by watching other Western movies and figuring out patterns, like, this is where they're going to get hit hard, right? And that's kind of how it was with Edom. I mean, they had just a, a crazy terrain, and they knew it better than anybody else, and, and they were able to, to use this to their advantage. In fact, it, it helped them not be conquered many times throughout history, even though they were a pretty small nation. Uh, they're kind of like a bunch of, you know, guerrilla warfare type fighters. And so th- this was the sort of thing that, that they would take pride in, right? The fact that they're up there in their, in their lofty dwelling, right? 
Um, but one of the th kind of funny things about prophetic literature is that a lot of times when you kind of know the context of what's going on, a lot of times uh, uh, the prophetic literature can be very like, like ironic and, and, and kind of make puns and stuff. And so what we see here is, is God saying, well, you have the, the, in verse 3, the pride of your heart has deceived you, you who live in the clefts of the rock in your lofty dwelling, who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? And then he says, from there, I will bring you down. And so God is saying, yeah, you, you, you're up here and, and, and you're higher than everybody else and you're impenetrable and you think you're really strong, but I'm stronger than you. I'm higher than you. Verse four, though you soar aloft like the eagle, though your nest is set among the stars, from there, I will bring you down. I don't know if it's just me, but, but have every, any of you guys ever like kind of felt like you're being watched in the woods or outside or something and you look and there's like a hawk or an eagle just staring at you. Ethan, Ethan's one. And they're just looking at you, right? They're not scared of you. You know, they, they don't care about you. They're just looking down on you, and they know that you can't get them, right? Right? That's kind of the idea here is that the Edomites, they were staring down with pride, and they were, they were looking down on the Israelites, and they were taking advantage of them, and they were going back up to their mountains, and they were safe and secure, and God is saying, no, no, no. You're not safe and secure from me because I am higher, I am more powerful, and I will bring you down, and I will make you Nothing, declares the Lord. Verses five and six says, if thieves come to you, if plunderers came by night, how you have been destroyed. Would they not steal only enough for themselves? If grape gatherers came to you, would they not leave gleanings? Um, so this is kind of a, a, an, an either or situation here, right? Or, or a comparison situation, I'm sorry. A comparison situation where, where God is, is, is telling them like two things that they'd be familiar with. Harvesters gathering grapes, thieves coming in and, and taking something in the middle of the night. And God is saying, if either of those things happened to Edom, there would be far more left than what God is going to do to them when his justice and his wrath comes. And so this is, this is bad. There's not going to be much left. And verse 6 kind of conveys that, and it's kind of interesting because verse 6 is almost as if Obadiah is, is breaking in with his own commentary. He's like breaking in because we have to remember that Obadiah is seeing a vision, right? And so it's, from what we know of like visions in scripture, um, we know that he was probably hearing things from God, but also like seeing things that God was doing or was going to do. And so Obadiah is seeing this vision and it's almost like he breaks in in verse six and he says, how Esau has been pillaged, his treasure sought out. And so this is a bad type of destruction. This is a, 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 a big <laughs> blow of justice from God. Moving into verse seven, it says, all your allies have driven you to your border. Those at peace with you have deceived you. They have prevailed against you. Those who eat your bread have set a trap beneath you. You have no understanding. This is another ironic twist because uh, kind of going off of the, what we know from the, from the storyline of this event is that, that the Edomites very likely made some sort of either official or unofficial tru truce or uh, military alliance with the Babylonians. And so God is saying, yeah, you, you think you're secure because you have a military alliance with the most powerful nation in, on, in the world. But I will work my ways to where, to where your allies will, will, uh, will, will turn on you, right? Those who eat bread with you will actually be setting a trap underneath you, and you won't even know it's coming. So God is saying, I'm going to use what you use to, to hurt my people, and I'm going to twist it up on you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring it around. I'm going to use what, what you use to gain at the expense of Israel to be your downfall. Then verses eight and nine, it says, will I not on that day, declares the Lord, destroy the wise men out of Edom and understanding out of Mount Esau and your mighty men shall be dismayed, O Timon, so that every man from Mount Esau will be cut off by slaughter. So we see a proclamation of death of the, the mightiest men, right? The, the protectors of Edom. God's saying, you know, they're not the ones that can protect you anymore. Like you, you done messed up, A.A. Ron, I'm coming down to get you, right? I mean, God is, God's not messing around here. And you know, he, here's the, the kind of funny thing about the justice of God. Um, raise your hand with me because I'm, I'm, I'm here too sometimes. Does, <laughs> okay, in a second, if you agree with me. Um, <laughs> if, does the justice of God, when you're reading through it, does it ever feel emotionally hard to come to grips with? Like, does it, does it ever does it ever feel like it's almost too harsh sometimes, right? Now, one of the things that, that's interesting about justice is that it's really nice when it's black and white, right? Like there are some times when we see justice is served and we, we know it's right, right? 
And then there are other times when we're like, man, I don't know, was it really deserving of that, right? Whether it's man's justice or God's justice, uh, sometimes it can be hard to, to kind of come to grips with. And, and as I was kind of reading and studying this, this passage, and it's all about God's justice, I, I kept seeing in the news, and you guys have probably seen it too, over, over the past couple weeks has been the, the arrest and then the, the suicide of Jeffrey Epstein, right? And now, however dubious that suicide may be, there, there was, there's a lot, one thing that almost everybody could agree on was that they weren't super sad about it, Right? I mean, you're talking about Jeffrey Epstein, a, a man who is involved in, in, in sex slavery and kidnapping and, and torture and, and all of these things with young children and all of these bad things, honestly, to a depth that we're still, try, we're still uncovering and may never uncover all of it. And when we see people like that, it's really easy to be like, all right, we need God's justice, Right? We need God's justice here because there is evil in the world. When you see it to that caliber, you just, you know that we need the justice of God. We need some intervention, right? It's pretty easy. It's pretty nice when it's black and white. And see, the, one of the ways that we, I think, kind of get hung up sometimes when we read in Scripture about God's justice is that, you know, we, we don't have the, the kind of cultural awareness that they did. We don't, we don't understand what the Israelites were going through. You see, Obadiah was giving this message to the Israelites, and honestly, it would have been a message of encouragement because the, the Israelites that he was giving it to, they would have been like kind of the remnant, the people that, that escaped being taken off to Babylonian captivity, the people that, that somehow didn't get you know, killed or captured or, or looted, or well, probably a lot of them got looted too by, by the Edomites. I mean, they were directly affected in so many ways, and so you know, it's, hard to, it's hard to sometimes put yourself into that context. But that's, that's, that's the, the, um, the context that's going on here. And, and really, this would have been a message of encouragement to the Israelites. They would, have been, they would have been like, man, all right, like, God actually cares. God actually saw what the Edomites did to us. God actually, actually knows what happened, and, and God wants to make things right. And so speaking of that, let's jump into verses 10 through 14, and let's see what the Edomites did. Why is God so mad? We already read it once, but we'll read it again. It says, because of the violence, and, and pay attention, I want to hear, when we're done with these verses, I want to hear a couple of you shout out the things that stick out to you as, as particularly heinous or bad. Because of the violence done to your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off forever. On the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth, and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem. You were like one of them. But do not gloat over the day of your brother in the day of his misfortune. Do not rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their ruin. Do not boast in the day of distress. Do not enter the gates of my people in the day of their calamity. Do not gloat over his disaster in the day of his calamity. Do not loot his wealth in the day of his calamity. Do not stand at the crossroads to cut off his fugitives. Do not hand over his survivors in the day of distress. All right, so what are some of the things that stuck out to you guys? What, what did Edom do? Yeah, they celebrated the downfall. They celebrated everything bad that was happening to them. Yeah. What else? Yeah. Cut off the fugitives. Yeah. So, like, can you imagine that? You know, your, your entire city is being ransacked, and you have managed to escape, you and your family. And, and you know, maybe you have your wife and your, your young children with you, and you're, you're running, and you're trying to escape. And then all of a sudden, you know, some Edomites, you know, your brothers, right, people that you know are, are there, and they're not to help you. They're going to capture you, and they're going to take you back to Babylon. Yeah. Did you? That was the one. That was the one. What else? Yeah. Seized their wealth. Yeah. Yeah, came in and, and, and looted the place when they were defenseless. What else? One more. Yeah. Yeah, made it, made it a game. Yeah, it was, just, it was fun and games for them. It wasn't, even, it wasn't even like a revenge thing. It was just, yeah, we're going to, get, we're going to come, and we're going to take it all. Um, yeah, I mean, that's just a, a few of the things mentioned here, but those are kind of all, that's almost all of it kind of summed up from you guys. Um, but suffice it to say, it's pretty heartless what Edom did, right? Some pretty ruthless stuff. And, and, and it's the type of thing that it's, it's kind of hard for us to, to really wrap our minds about, because, I mean, we, we live in such a secure country um, and, and even a different time period where we're not really worried about, you know, an invading army coming in, capturing our city, and taking us off into slavery, Right? We have other worries, but we're not really worried about that. Um, 
But this is some bad stuff that Edom did. You know, they came in, they looted, captured those trying to flee, and, and, and took them away, you know? And though that's kind of hard to, to put your mind into that exactly, um, we see a lot of injustices in our world today, don't we? I mean, we see a lot of uh, the same caliber bad stuff happening around us. You know, we, we see hurricanes come in and ravage a community, and, and, and we see looters come in then, right? When a community is at, at its most vulnerable and come in and break into their houses and steal stuff all for their own gain. And then even speaking of national, na- natural disasters, you know, people around the world will donate monies to organizations, monies, donate money to organizations, and, and, and then we see powerful people and politicians and whoever it is divert the money into their own pockets while the victims are, are, are left with no aid, right? I mean, we see that all the time. We see tons of bad things happening, honestly, a lot like this. We see broken communities where they're, they're so broken that sex traffickers can come in and they don't even have to, to steal the children sometimes, they'll just buy them from the parents. And we know that children don't last more than five to seven years on average in, in, in that type of environment. We see how entire culture and, and, and Hollywood and media will objectify women as nothing more than physical objects. We see how, how we live in, 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 in a culture and, and really just a world that rewards brutal people from doing bad things to get ahead in life, right? I mean, we see injustice all around us, and honestly, there are times when we can look at all the injustices around us. We can see all the bad people getting away with bad things, and we can feel a little bit like the Israelites, right? We can feel a little bit like the Israelites. We can, we can see all these things and, and think to ourselves, well, maybe God doesn't really care that much. Maybe God doesn't see all of the bad things. Maybe he doesn't see all the injustices in the world. Or maybe he sees it all, but it's just kind of like, that's how it is here, right? But that's also when we can become complacent, when we can be tempted to compromise. And you're thinking, where am I going with this? See, so often when we read passages like this in Obadiah, we read these passages of justice, we instantly align ourselves with the oppressed instead of the oppressor, don't we? Kind of naturally do that. It's kind of like when you watch Avengers, you're not like, man, I wish, I wish that I was Thanos, right? I mean, maybe you do, okay, but we can talk about that later, like in counseling or something. Um, <laughs> but usually you're aligning yourself, you're like, man, I, I want to be Black Widow, I want to be Captain America, right? We instantly align ourselves with the good guys, and when we read passages like this, we, we align ourselves with the oppressed instead of the oppressors, and we don't even consider, are we doing things that the Edomites were doing? But instead, we make an excuse for it, and we say, well, not that bad, right? I mean, these were some pretty bad things that we saw from the Edomites, right? Maybe we're tempted to look around us and say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not that bad, and that's when we're, we're tempted to, to throw a coworker under the bus at a co-op because we really want the full-time job, and, and we say, well, that's, that's just business, right? We have all these excuses. Maybe we say that, that uh, we get complacent and, and we look around at, at, at those that we dislike and we gloat over their misfortune, but the excuse is, well, we, we, don't, we don't do it to their face, right? Inwardly gloating. Maybe we gloat to our friends about them, Right? Maybe, maybe when we become complacent and we think, well, we're not that bad, then, then we're willing to watch pornography and, we're, and, and we don't want to think about how pornography and sex slavery are, are fueling each other and we're fueling the beast and we just say, well, I know it's bad, but I'm not a sex trafficker, right? I'm not that bad. Maybe we participate in gossip and then we stand up high like the Edomites and we watch and we gloat over the misfortune of whoever we maligned but it's not like you beat them up or something. You know, see, this is where we're tempted to, to cheat on a test, but it's because everybody does it. You see, we have all of these excuses to justify why our actions aren't that bad. We read these stories in the Bible and we say, no, nope, we don't deserve justice because we're not as bad as the Edomites, right? We're the oppressed. We're, we're like the good guys and all the other people are the bad guys. We're not as bad as the Edomites. We're not as bad as these people in society. And we have all of these excuses for why we're not that bad. And I want to ask you guys tonight, what part of the oppressor are you playing in your own life? When you read this passage, granted, there are times when you should look at it and you should say, you know what? 
I have been oppressed. God's people have been oppressed. And, and I am hoping and longing for the justice of God. That is, a, that is a good and needed application from this passage. But another application that we can have is to read this passage and to say, how am I like the Edomites? Even if it's just a little bit. Even if it's not that bad. I want to show you guys something. In, in verses 10 through 14, if you pull it up, what is the word that is repeated time after time after time in those verses right there? Just, calamity is one, but there's another that's even more. Do not. Okay, that, that's also true. <laughs> you guys. <laughs> All right, what? Say another one then. What's it? Day. Okay, day is repeated. I don't know if it's repeated more than do not, but day is repeated, I think, the most times um, in, this, in this passage, right? And, and, and what this communicates here, well, anytime you're reading scripture, when you see, when you see uh, words repeated time and time again, it's important. So go back, figure out why it's there so many times. But, it, you know, it says, on the day that you stood aloof, on the day of your, of your brother of his misfortune, on the day of their ruin, on the day of their distress, on the day of their calamity, on the day of his calamity, on the day of his calamity, on the day of distress, right? It's repeated all of these times. And what it's emphasizing to the listeners is that God saw the very real bad things, bad injustices that were done to his people. He sees them in present tense and he knows what's happening. And then in verse 15, it says, for the day of the Lord is near upon all the nations. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return on your own head. For as you have drunk on my holy mountain, so all the nations shall drink continually. They shall drink and swallow and shall be as though they had never been. See, my friends, in the same way that God sees the very moment that people do bad things and bad injustices are, are happening in the world, God knows that there is a very physical and real day that his justice will come and he will make things right. And I want to I wanna challenge you guys tonight, when you're reading scripture, be, be honest with the fact that our hearts are sinful. Be honest with the fact that you're not always the pure oppressed one that's waiting on the salvation of the Lord. Be honest with the fact that sometimes you might relate more to the bad guys in the story because you've got some things in your life that, that you need to get rid of. And I want to challenge you guys to, 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 to figure out what injustices are you maybe participating in. What injustices do you need to get out of your life? You see, this is why Paul said in Romans chapter 6, he said, should we keep on sinning so that grace, grace may increase? By no means. And he yelled it, right? Because Paul knows that as God's people... We have grace, but we shouldn't keep on sinning. We shouldn't keep doing things like the Edomites, even if it's just not quite that bad. Paul knows that we shouldn't keep on sinning. And far too often, I think we immediately place ourselves almost on the wrong side of Scripture without even considering, are there some things that I need to get out of my life that the bad guys in the passage are doing? You see, from a theological standpoint, Edom represents kind of all enemies of God from all time. And, and, and one of the big things that you take from this is that, that no matter how powerful the, the, the world's powers are, the, the world's systems, people in the world are, they're, they're not going to overpower God. And, and, and God sees what's happening, and, and God is going to come and make things right. And this isn't a, a scare you to Jesus sermon. This is, this is an, an examine our own hearts because there's a J of justice coming sermon. <laughs> Slightly different, right? This, is, I'm, this isn't trying to scare you guys into like loving Jesus or something. Um, this is a sermon that, that, that I hope will, will convict every single one of us to, to say, you know what? Yeah, I do look at all the bad things in the world, the really bad things, and I compare myself to that. And because of this, I'm way better than them, Right? And then I feel like my actions are justified. I feel like I'm kind of righteous because of that. And too often we, we want to point at other people. We want to point at other things, other organizations, other this, other that. And we don't even want to check our own hearts. And when we do that, we're just like the Pharisees. Hypocrites, right? We want to point at other people's faults and never look at their own hearts while they're bringing up their own personal righteousness. <laughs> 
I want to end on, on, this, on this point. Grace, grace is a wonderful gift that we cannot do anything to earn on our own. And the reason I say that is because when we read this passage, we have to realize that every single one of us deserve what, what the Edomites got, what God was saying about the Edomites. And grace is something that we cannot earn our, on our own, but through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins, we can, we can receive that grace through belief and faith in him. The book of Obadiah is, is both kind of an eternal proclamation that a day of justice will come, but it can also be a message that can shake us a little bit, that can, that can shake our, our kind of hardened hearts and, and get us out of our complacency with sin. I want to end with Paul's words in Romans chapter 6. It's on the U version if you want to follow along. <laughs> Verses 1 through 4, he says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him and by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. My friends, let's not act like the Edomites, even if it's just a little bit even if it's not that bad. As believers, as Christians, let's walk in newness of life. Let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, God, we come to you now and we, we thank you so much for your word. Um, we thank you for the ability to, to study your word together tonight. And God, we thank you even for uh, some of the, the stranger, smaller um, books in the Bible um, and we thank you for preserving your word so that we can know more about you and know how better to serve you. God, I pray that in the same way that Obadiah is, is an encouraging, uh, encouraging book to those who are oppressed, I pray that we would also look at it and say to ourselves, are, are we the oppressor? And that this would be something that could convict us to, to, to get these sins out of our life, to get bad things out of our life as we try to become more like you. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen.